Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest in our Eno for Center for, Center for Transportation webinars. My name is Paul Lewis. I'm the policy director here at Eno, and today we're discussing transit strategies to meet climate goals. Um, we know that cutting greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, which in the United States accounts for 29% of total emissions, um, is going to take a multifaceted approach, lots of different strategies. Um, one of those strategies is leveraging public transit networks um, to meet those ends. Um, that's going to be uh, an opportunity and also a challenge, uh, in part because COVID has slashed ridership, um, it's posed uh, looming financial problems for transit operators, um, but it's also an opportunity to rethink regional transportation net networks and operations and adapt to changing travel patterns and demands. Um, so today we're talking about not just how transit agencies, but how regions in general are deploying new incentives, policies, and tools to make transit part of that sustainable mo mobility initiative. Um, so we have uh, three uh, guests with us today to help talk through these issues. Um, we're, we're scattered all over the world, um, and I'm going to introduce them briefly here. We have Sam Longman, who is coming from London at the moment. Um, so thanks for joining us in the, in the evening for you. The, he's the head of corporate environment at Transport for London. Um, and so again, thanks, Sam, for joining. We also have Anna Allwright who is a strategy specialist at Cubic Transportation Systems, joining us from California. Um, and we have Jerome Horn, who is the Director of Transit Leadership Development at Transit Center um, from New York City. Um, so thank you very much for volunteering your time and expertise in this conversation today. And so before we launch into that, I just have a couple housekeeping items for everybody. Um, the, the format for today's webinar is a conversation, so there's no slides or PowerPoints. Um, I'll be asking the panelists some of my own questions, and then we're going to be transitioning to some of the questions that you all have on, uh, on the live webinar. Um, you can enter your questions in the questions box on the side of your screen at any time, and I'm going to get to as many of those as possible. Um, and while we don't ex expect any technology issues, we found that um, if you are experiencing some uh, individual issues, um, try refreshing your page. Um, that tends to work out some of those, those smaller issues. Um, if you're having other issues, please click the help bottom at the bottom left of your screen um, if you need more assistance. Um, and then we'll be emailing a recording of this webinar to everybody following uh, the, today's broadcast. Um, so with that, we're going to launch into the conversation. Again, really excited to talk about this issue. And, and um, I'm going to pick on Jerome to, to kick us off. Um, Jerome, given your role at Transit Center, um, you work with agencies, regions across the United States. Um, you know, one of the things that that folks are really interested in is is examples, right? Things that 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 we've you've been seeing that we've been seeing um, that are working. Um, can you just talk a little bit about some strategies um, that regions are using to leverage their transit systems in this capacity, and and some of the the positive things that you've been seeing? Sure. Thanks, Paul. Uh, delighted to be here. So, uh, you know, transit is being seen more and more as an essential part of our fight against the climate crisis and emergency. And uh, a recent research analysis from the International Panel on Climate Change and the National Academies of Science has shown that improving public transit is a critical climate solution and a contributor to equity. Um, collectively, their work is showing us that internationally, shifting to public transit is an essential mitigation solution with very low cost that supports sustainable development goals. And in the context of the United States, if we are able to transform public transit, we could reduce emissions by the equivalent of 120 million metric tons of CO2 annually. And that's uh, about a tenth of the greenhouse gas reductions needed to decarbonize passenger surface transportation. Um, and the greatest impact from that will come from increasing transit ridership and associated changes in land use, as opposed to simply electrifying transit vehicles. So I want to emphasize that, you know, it, it's not enough to, to just electrify the vehicles, but we also need to make sure that we have service expansion uh, to help reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so in terms of public policy, 
um, you know, one of the most thing, important things to make transit more useful is making it accessible and more competitive, uh, competitive with driving in terms of travel time, reliability, affordability, and convenience. So in, in other words, transit's only as useful as the service that it provides. And we need to run trains and buses more frequently throughout most of the day every day and how often a bus or train comes is a really big decision factor for getting more people to use transit as a primary means of transportation. Um, you can imagine if a bus only runs once an hour or even if it's every 30 minutes, um, that service is not useful to a lot of people. And for those who strictly rely on transit, you know, missing that bus could be the difference between them getting to that doctor's appointment on time, being late for class or even losing a job. So uh, in the local context, we've seen a few communities um, begin to take steps to expand and improve transit service. Uh, Indianapolis is one example. They passed a transit referendum back in 2016 to help support transit expansion. And they're working towards a network redesign and building out an electrified bus rapid transit network. Um, Houston is another city. They were sort of the first large U.S. city to do a bus network redesign that emphasized prioritizing specific corridors with more frequent service and better crosstown connections. Uh, and they've also passed uh, transit referendums in order to support uh, transit expansion. Um, and then I want to speak to sort of what is also happening in the transit advocacy space. Um, there has been increasingly, um, you know, advocates have been increasingly sounding the alarm on transit being used as a critical tool in our climate and equity fight. Um, and it's important to note that many people who rely on transit are often black and brown, low income, and live in areas of environmental justice concern. Transit can certainly play a big role in making these communities more equitable and work towards reducing GHG emissions. Uh, and one example of this is the organization Transit Matters in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, they were successful in getting the state Senate to amend a climate policy bill um, that includes a mandate for commuter rail electrification, which enables faster and more reliable service. Um, this is pending legislation, but we think it's a good example um, of how local advocates can make uh, the transit and climate connection. In addition, uh, the MBTA, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority that operates local service in the Boston metropolitan region, um, they're also taking uh, steps to run their commuter rail system more like a regional rail system that we see in other parts of the world. And that means, you know, running trains more frequently in both directions all day, every day, and also lowering the cost of fares um, to allow many of the low, uh, low income neighborhoods that the tr these trains pass through uh, better access to the system. Um, and then I'll close with you know, we have a great opportunity before us uh, right now with the recent passage of the infrastructure bill in the U.S. Um, there's a pot of highway funding uh, that state DOTs can actually flex and use towards building transit projects as well as bike and pedestrian improvements. Um, so there's a number of federal aid highway programs um, that can be flexed. Examples of that are the congestion mitigation and air quality uh, program, CMAC, um, surface transportation block grants, and even tribal transport, the tribal transportation program. And one way uh, that this is manifesting, we actually are seeing uh, a new project in Houston once again, the um, Houston Metro and at TxDOT, um, they're actually building a what's called the Intercady um, Flyover Bus Project. And this project is being built with regional transportation formula funds. Um, the same pot that can be used for highways uh, instead of new starts. And this project will bring uh, an elevated busway uh, that will provide faster service for express buses currently stuck in traffic on the main freeway, creates a new BRT route with high quality stations and accessible access to frequent local routes. Uh, and the other cool aspect is that the BRT will actually interface with the light rail downtown and actually use the same platforms as light rail to provide level boarding. Um, and so I want to, you know, close with reiterating, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about electrification uh, of transit vehicles and buses in particular, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we also want to make sure that we don't get lost in, in that uh, the conversation doesn't get lost in um, really what's most important and what's going to cause that sort of tectonic mode shift is that we can make transit more convenient, compatible, accessible, and, and most uh, most importantly, frequent and, and available. That's really uh, probably the best thing that we can do in terms of, of policy and and using transit uh, as, as a resource to help fight climate change. And, and the final thing I'll say is that we're also seeing some exciting examples of transit systems beginning to think about land use uh, and zoning, particularly transit systems that may have park and rides or, or stations with huge parking lots are beginning to look at TOD opportunities 
is um, affordable housing included as well, um, ways to help you know, reduce people's need to drive and keep people um, in close proximity and access to transit. Very good. You know, it's, it's funny as you're going through that, um, you're, you're addressing the questions as they're coming in, right? There's a lot of questions that have been coming in as, as you're talking and you're hitting on a lot of topics that I want to, I want to drill into here in a few minutes, but I want to, um, uh, next shift over to Anna, Anna, you've at Cubic, right? You work with transit agencies all over the world, right? Yep. And, and have a lot of uh, interesting examples. I mean, what are you seeing as some strategies that are coming out, um, in the U.S. and globally, that are that are that transit agencies and regions are using to um, to uh, uh, address climate change goals. Yeah, absolutely. So there's not really a one size fits all approach because every city is dealing with their own unique sets of issues. Um, some of the things that I've been seeing that's really positive in Australia, you're starting to see in places like Sydney, Victoria this consolidation of their transport agencies. So bringing together, you know, agencies that previously funded uh, roads and public transport in isolation and operating in silos, now coming together as this kind of mega agency. So we're coming together and having this more cohesive planning approach so that it's not public transport competing with roads and roads projects and not kind of cannibalizing or taking away from public transport. But now it's uh, having a more multimodal and holistic view of how we manage the network and share data. So just as an example, in Sydney, they're in the middle of deploying their first fully multimodal transport management system. And this is going to allow better shifting of de uh, demand and supply between driving public transport and make the network as a whole more responsive. Um, in London, and I'm sure Sam will cover this, but they've been doing some fa fantastic things with their low, emi uh, low emission zones and congestion pricing, um, which I think is a bit more of a stick approach to incentivizing people away from driving and helping air quality and lower emissions in zones um, like the CBD, which are typically high. Um, in the United States, I think we're seeing with the infrastructure bill some really positive changes towards, you know, providing more funding for public transport and also, uh, you know, using language that incentivizes the removal of some of these giant freeways that have been segregating and separating our communities. Um, I think, you know, you've got some positive things happening with the introduction of dynamic pricing more and more on the road network. Um, but also, you know, implementing strategies to help entice riders to switch to public transport and bringing more of those choice riders in. So part of that is making sure there's greater interoperability across our network with the micro mobility options, the public transport backbone, um, making sure, you know, that reliability is there, that buses are not getting caught in traffic delays. Um, we've got safe intersections for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, we've got the infrastructure there to support people accessing our public transport system with pedestrian footpaths, lighting. Um, and I think all of these things are really positive uh, changes that we're starting to see, which I think will, um, you know, help shift people onto public transport, um, but also improve the way our um, networks operate as a whole uh, to help us meet our climate goals. Anna, you started off talking about uh, governance and consolidation, and that's certainly something that's happened in London, right, where, where TFL is responsible for not just the transit system, but the bike and ped network and the roadways and the congestion pricing and, and a lot of things. So Sam, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, and get some of your insights um, from London and what are some of the, the strategies that, that you all have been working on um, and, and what seems to be working. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. And I do think um, in many ways, uh, London and transport for, for London, it, 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 you know, in quite a good place in that we are the integrated transport authority for the city. Um, we work very closely with the mayor in not only producing the transport strategy, but the spatial plan as well, the economic development strategy, the uh, health inequalities 
strategy, the environment strategy. So we do have the luxury of having a very integrated approach. So as well as being the strategic transport authority and, and effectively setting the policy for all transport services in London, we run a vast majority of the public transport services, all the different things that Anna kind of touched on there, as well as regulating services as, as well, have a real mixed approach of directly running services and franchising others, depending on what's the, the best thing to do. We're also a huge landowner as well. And uh, we, you know, we're doing our own development, building housing for the mayor, uh, very much taking a kind of sustainable transport and public transport first approach um, uh, to, to our role in, in developing London. Um, with public transport though does face uh, huge challenges. Um, it's interesting, you know, I feel like we're in a kind of third phase really, you know, it used to be very much predict and provide, that was the old school public transport approach. And then in London, and I think many places around the world, it became about public transport's role in driving growth. Actually, it's a, it's a key enabler in economic growth and unlocking development. Um, and actually, we relied very much on that growth in public transport use. You know, we borrowed against it, essentially. Uh, uh, that's how we were able to keep improving and increasing our services. Um, but now, really, uh, there's definitely been a setback, uh, as we've all experienced. You know, in London, actually, unlike pretty much any other uh, global major city, we're heavily reliant on fare income. You know, it's like around 70%. Um, and the ridership absolutely plummeted. Um, and so we're really having to rethink um, our strategy. Um, we're not going to get back uh, to 100% pre-pandemic levels anytime soon. Uh, we're hoping to go get to about 80%, but actually it's kind of stubbornly stuck at uh, uh, two thirds at the moment, 66%. That kind of makes sense if you think it, if people are generally working at home two days a week. Um, but it's so important we don't forget that the strategy we had, the mayor's transport strategy is still our strategy, is the right strategy. And it was designed in a very resilient way. Um, uh, and we're still trying to do the same thing. We're still aiming for, for mode shift. We're still aiming for an integrated, inclusive, affordable, clean, safe, controlled transport network that is about sustainable transport first. And that's public transport as in transit, um, buses, rail, but also walking and cycling. I think they go hand in hand. You know, people walk and cycle to public transport to get on it and off it. And it's about creating uh, people centric cities uh, and communities and spaces. So you can't just, you know, design a new rail line and plonk a station there uh, because the way that area, the uh, urban realm, and the activity and having a mixed use development in terms of uses, but also demographics is what makes a sustainable city. So we're still very much taking that approach. And our transport strategy actually has a, an a explicit policy in it that says, policy 23, one of my favorite policies, um, I'm sure you all have your favorite transport policy. It basically says, we don't know what the future holds. And actually we're all experiencing, you know, the world's accelerating, technology's accelerating. That's not gonna stop, we're gonna keep accelerating. So we don't know what's coming down the line, but whatever comes down the line, it has to conform to this policy. All those things I said before, and Anna talked about, and Jerome talked about, inclusive, safe, clean, etc. cetera. Um, so I think generally, you know, our, our, our as I say, our strategy is, is still the right one. Um, uh, we, you know, we've, there's been a lot of focus in um, uh, maintaining that confidence in, in the network, uh, making sure that, you know, we're, we're doing the cleaning, we're making sure that's overt, um, that, it, that it feels safe, because we've, the, the private cars and the road vehicles has bounced back, that got very quickly back to nearly 100%, and we don't want to have a car-led uh, recovery, um, so it's really important that we maintain that confidence. It's really hard with the funding situation. Because if you can't maintain your asset base, you end up in a downward spiral because we will always only run safe services. So if we can't maintain our assets, we're going to have to reduce services. And if you reduce services, you reduce ridership. Then you reduce your fare income and you've got less money to invest in services. Whereas there's a spiral that goes the other way, that if you provide good public transport, if you have a people centric city that includes walking and cycling, 
people want to use that public transport, then your revenue goes up and you can increase more in it. You can decarbonize your services as well, create a kind of green and resilient uh, city. Uh, so it's a very challenging time. And, and I, I'll stop there because I'm sure we'll come on to some of the strategies we're, we're thinking about in terms of how we adjust our approach based on those suite of available uh, powers and policy options that we've got. Thank you. Appreciate that, Sam. And I, I want to bounce back a question right to you because there's, there's a couple of comments coming in on, on the questions function, kind of um, getting at that the spiral, right? I think everyone recognizes the the death spiral, right? You know, reduce service, you reduce ridership, and it kind of it, it, that naturally unfolds that way. But the virtuous cycle doesn't seem to be holding up like it used to, right? We're we're in many cases providing more service, or we're adding in new bus lanes, we're making improvements. And ridership is stubbornly kind of stuck. Um, and you know, I think if we're trying to, especially planners and 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 folks at agencies and, and people that are that are working on these things, how can they be sure that these strategies are going to get the intended outcomes? Perhaps maybe not in the next twelve months, but but down the road. I mean, what 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 level of confidence do we have that that virtuous cycle is going to play out in a very different era? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very real question. And my response is we need to be careful as kind of public transport people or transit people not to get high on our own supply. The purpose of transport and a strategic authority like TfL is to create a sustainable city that's inclusive and that it's safe and, and everyone uh, can have a prosperous life. That doesn't necessarily mean we need to provide as much public transport as possible we need to build as much we need to get ridership up as much as possible so we can get the fare revenue in um because that's the kind of consumption driven growth mindset now i'm not saying we don't need more public transport and more ridership in fact i do think that but we need to first think about what we ultimately trying to build here and it's a sustainable way of life you know we already know vast majority of people live in cities and that's going to increase and we've got a huge challenge here that uh, in, in terms of climate change and the ecological crisis um, you know we've been on this kind of path of development for the last two or three hundred years it's been fantastic look, look at all this positive that we've had out of it um, but we're now going into the next phase of humanity where we're basically about to do a 90 degree turn and literally everything about our organizations and the way we work and the way we think is going to change because it's going to have to change so we need to think of, through the lens of sustainability and, and the point being, we need to think about the system. What kind of system are we trying to build and what's our role in it? And, and that then goes to, you know, down to kind of community wealth building, spatial planning, how you, uh, what policies you can do to make it more affordable, inclusive, fair. So it doesn't really directly answer your question uh, because the, I think I've already covered that in terms of you've got to maintain your asset base. You've got to do all that stuff, but there isn't like a silver bullet here it is difficult and actually we've we have a defining policy in our transport strategy which is 80 percent of trips by walking cycling public transport that's still our goal when tfl was set up in 2000 it was around 53 we're up to about 63 64 um and and we still need to 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 focus uh on that defining goal uh, and and uh building a sustainable uh city and thinking about uh system change and our role within it very good. Um, Anna, any, I saw you nodding your head along to, to, to some of that. Um, any reactions you have to that and kind of how, how we, you know, I have confidence that some of these strategies are going to work? Yeah, I think I agree with a lot of what Sam said. And I think you can't be afraid of failure, you know, to not be willing to try something and see if it works. And I think, that's why, you know, as Sam was saying, it's not everyone has to take public transport or the more services, the better. I think, you know, there's a place for so many different technology solutions and innovative options. And it's not to say necessarily that one mobility mode or one mode of transport is is better than others. You know, most journeys these days are multimodal. Um, and so where we can encourage walking and cycling, where we can encourage part of that leg to be on public transport, that's that's fantastic, but it doesn't have to be public transport only. Um, you see a lot of uh, micro mobility operators, and it's 
uh, coming into play and, you know, it's how we can work and trial these things to make sure they're serving the community needs and to serve that overarching goal that Sam mentioned of building this safe, equitable, inclusive, sustainable transport society. So, yes, we want to increase ridership. Yes, we want to provide more services and make sure people are having equal access to opportunity, but we really need to ensure that as we're doing this, you know, we're not afraid to fail and to, if something's not working, to change our approach. Um, and a big part of that is engaging with our communities because, you know, you could sit here and say, well, yeah, that community has been served. They've got three bus routes, but you go to that community and they're like, yeah, but I can't, you know, wait in this dark bus stop. It's not safe. Or, but I can't get there because there's no sidewalk or no crossing. And so I think, you know, it's this big picture of trialing different things and making sure that, you know, what we're trying to do is not defined by, you know, trying to implement certain innovations or certain approaches. It's trying to meet, you know, that overarching community goal and that overarching need of what a sustainability city looks like. And that's going to be different in every, every place. Agreed. Um, Jerome, I want to turn it back to you um, and, and see if you have any reactions to this, particularly on the, the, the financial side of things. So you mentioned a lot of strategies that are, I think, compelling. Um, you know, you talked about commuter rail electrification and increasing frequencies and investing in bus lanes, right? Um, some of that, I think, can be paid through through IAJA money, right? Some of the, the historic investment coming from the federal government. Um, but there's an opportunity cost, right? When we're talking about climate strategies, um, how, how do we kind of square the circle with the financial piece and um, invest in new strategies where we're also facing a potential financial cliff? Yeah, um, it's, that's a great question. And, you know, in addition to, to, to the opportunity that, that's now here with, uh, you know, new pots of money from the passes of the infrastructure bill, um, as I mentioned that, you know, I think more and more we're also seeing individual communities uh, kind of take matters into their own hands. Um, as I mentioned, Indianapolis and Houston, but there are several cities around the U.S. that have held, um, you know, ballot measures to, to raise more revenue to support transit service expansion and operations. Um, you know, the, there's a few others out there. Um, you know, obviously we've seen uh, one of our largest ones in, in both Seattle and Los Angeles, um, but many cities are, are deciding, you know, from the local level that, you know, we can't necessarily rely or wait uh, for federal funds to, to trickle in. And so uh, that's another approach that, that a lot of communities are beginning to, to see the value of investing in transit and beginning to, to come together with that local piece. And then the other part of it, too, um, when you think about local and federal, um, a lot of times if you are applying for a competitive grant program on the federal level, having matching local funds uh, can be uh, a big you know, uh, factor in the scoring of your project and whether or not that project gets to move forward. Um, so it's really important for communities to, to, to think about that, um, you know, from a financial standpoint. So we're getting a couple questions um, that are similar to what I have um, have here on, in my notes, talking about some of the non-transit strategies, right? I'm calling them non-transit because it's kind of outside of the jurisdiction of a, a normal transit agency related to things like congestion pricing, which a few of you mentioned, um, but also things like parking minimums or, or different kind of parking policies. You know, what, what are some strategies that we've seen in that realm that's working? Uh, and maybe we'll go back to you, Sam, because do you have uh, congestion pricing in, in London? Um, has, that, has that scheme changed at all um, during COVID? What is it meaning for transit? Um, and, and then also, and we'll go Sam and then Anna and then Jerome talking about some of those non-transit strategies that, that you think of are really compelling in today's uh, environment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing I just, there's a, there's a point I forgot to make when I spoke last time and then Anna uh, actually made the point better than me, but it was about chipping away. So the mode shift, there isn't a silver bullet. It's about all of those policies working together and chipping away. That, that's the point I wanted to make. Um, and also on the finance one, which is kind of linked to your non-transport uh, policy Point, and I will answer your question. Um, I'm very keen that part of our suite of things we try to do is thinking in terms of place. 
is actually, I think, a lot of potential private investment out there. But we need to package it up in a way that they can see how they can invest in it, where you but in a way where you're not just cherry picking off the good stuff. So we need to make sure we've got a, a good, strong project pipeline that we can put forward for that investment. Um, and you're kind of cross financing and you're doing blended finance, you're including avoided costs, grants, as well as things where there's a return, such as energy as service or any kind of revenue opportunities and things like that. I think that's a really important part of um, uh, how we transition our cities. And, it, and it's a, you know, it's a key part of um, non transport policies around kind of, you know, we've got all these buildings as well that we need to, to retrofit. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to do it in a way that's efficient and we don't end up with all the disruption of ripping up the roads to increase the kind of uh, grid capacity and things like that? Um, so we do need to think in terms of an overall integrated joined up plan. Uh, um, so in terms of, uh, so your question is around non-transit policies, like congestion charging you want me to talk about, don't you? Yeah. Right. Okay, so, <laughs> so the really important thing with all of this is as we've been trying to do, is to sell the positive vision about what kind of life you're giving back to people. I mean, the, the, our transport strategy is all about health. And uh, the, the congestion charge, um, interestingly, uh, uh, the, the support for it shot up after it went in. We did a lot of work on complementary measures as well. So it wasn't just the stick. People got all the extra public transport. They got their street environment transformed at the same time. You know, if you build it, they will come. And I, you know, I used to work in one of the L London boroughs, and we often talked about this idea of having these beacons. If you can create an area and show people what it would be like, everyone else will want that. And with the air quality, I mean, our ultra low emission zone that's expanding. You know, and the mayor is now proposing to cover the whole city. It already does for for larger vehicles, but for all vehicles, it's quite amazing actually. If you think about it, you know, we're basically charging people where they used to be able to drive for free essentially other than you know cost of fuel and stuff like that but the support was really high for that scheme and how we got the support is we built the evidence base and we did the communication engagement about how it would personally benefit people rich or poor no matter where they were from their lives were going to be better because it was affecting children's health and that's actually one of the great cells on on uh, action on air quality we need to find a similar cell on action on climate change because that is a big problem that people don't you know if you're wealthy comparatively speaking you don't see how it's going to actually impact on you and you're more concerned about economic growth and there was a question in the chat about costs and we know the evidence overwhelmingly says that investment in the climate transition will far outweigh the costs of the impacts that we're starting to see and we'll see in the future so that's how our road users are charging schemes basically are successful um, is that uh, uh we've sold the be benefits we've had complementary measures so it's not just the car also the schemes have been very carefully designed working with stakeholders to make sure that um we're really looking at the equality impacts and uh that it's understandable and it's easy to use and, and therefore you get the big support and in particular you need to get the people that don't drive supporting it and speaking up we know as policymakers that people speak up when they don't like something but actually most people in london don't have access to a car we need them to speak up and say, actually, I want a cleaner city. I want more space for green infrastructure, for walking and cycling. So I support this scheme. Uh, and that's, you know, we call it rolling the pitch, you know, like a cricket pitch. That's basically uh, uh, the journey we're on now for this next phase of, of road user charging schemes. But of course, you need to do things like limiting parking supply in developments and on street. Um, there are places in London where it is three times more expensive to park your bike in an on street light cycle hocker that, locker than it is to put your car on the street. I mean, that there's something seriously wrong there that needs to be addressed, in my opinion. Um, and it's about calling out these unfairnesses, inequalities, and all these benefits that you get back. Thanks. Anna? Yeah, so I think Sam did a great job of talking about the low emission zone and congestion pricing. Um, I think when we look at parking, so much of our, you know, public road space is desi designated to parking. And I think COVID was a great example of what, you know, a city could look like if we didn't need to dedicate this space. You know, we had lots of restaurants, building outdoor dining areas. And so I think there are some really interesting examples of what various cities are trying to do here with either limiting 
the the parking supply, um, charging for it uh, dynamically, whether you're a freight user, whether you're a commuter, to try and kind of prevent this this situation where we can't use that space for you know cycleways or bus rapid transit or dining parks and and other things. So I think. Um, there's a, a very interesting uh, role that that's going to play moving forward in how we shape our cities. And also, um, you know, with parking, it's a it's a cost that doesn't really always get equated with the cost of your car. You know, it's um, it's sort of external. You buy your car, you pay for maintenance, you pay for your registration, uh, you pay for petrol and you pay for parking. But none of this is ever grouped together to be considered as one kind of holistic cost the way, you know, someone who, who lives in London knows they've got to pay six pounds for the tube and it's probably going to cost six pounds back and it will usually take this amount of time. And I think, you know, being able to communicate more of these costs to people and give them that real idea of how much their journey is going to cost, what the time cost of finding that parking spot is, uh, what the, the cost of, you know, the congestion charge, if it's dynamic, communicating that before it goes up and before you're sitting in congestion um, in tandem with making sure those public transport services are an available alternative is important because I think, you know, there's no point having dynamic road pricing if by the time the price has gone up you're already in your car and already in traffic you know it needs to be communicated early so people have that option to make a different choice and obviously that different choice needs to be there and i think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with how agencies share their data and how we plan the implementation of these non-transit policies with the rollout or addition of services so that it does work in tandem and people who who you know don't want to drive actually have the option not to and the people that do want to drive are paying for that that benefit um, but I, I do think we need to be careful when we look at the implementation to make sure we're not you know punishing people that don't have the alternative um, you know a lot of our more vulnerable populations are transport dependent and and a lot of them are also car dependent because of the lack of that the availability of services so we need to make sure when we look at you know taxing uh non-electric vehicle owners implementing congestion zones that you know we are giving people an option because otherwise we're just going to be harming the more vulnerable uh transport users and road users very good jerome i want to make sure you have a chance to to chime in yeah, uh, Sam and Anna have done an excellent job uh, talking about different strategies. Um, I'll just say, you know, I think the saying goes, every great transportation plan is also a land use plan. Um, you know, and we can't think of them as separate things. A lot of times you tend to think of a, a specific transit project and a silo. Um, and I, I really think the land use and zoning conversation is is a big part of this um, that, that goes beyond the transit itself. Um, uh, largely in, in many places around the world, but of course, very prevalent in the US, the, the physical built environment really dictates uh, people's access and how they interact with the environment and how they decide to move about the environment. And uh, as we know, we, we've done a lot of damage with building highways, you know, through communities, uh, particularly black and brown communities and, and disconnecting, um, you know, people from, from access and having a, a comprehensive um, community feeling. And then, uh, as Anna mentioned, we have a lot of folks, too, that are, are priced out of living in neighborhoods that are more walkable and dense. And so there's a saying you have to drive until you qualify so they can afford a home, but that home might be exurban or almost rural and access to transit is very little or non-existent. Um, so I, I really think, you know, cities, um, transit agencies, local governments really need to think more comprehensively about the, the design of the physical built environment and can we retrofit suburbia? Can we think about ways to, you know, provide better connections? And this this whole notion of complete streets, I think really speaks to this where, you know, it, it, when you, I always laugh, you look back at an old photograph of a city and you see horses and buggies and bikes and people and kids playing, right? And there's like all this stuff happening. And it's almost like we decided we went to this place of, okay, cars get the priorities, the streets are only for cars. And now we're going back to realizing, wait a minute, 
like streets should be for everyone and different vehicle types. And um, we should really be thinking about our communities as nodes. Uh, there's a big push for 20 minute or 15 minute uh, cities or communities. And basically the idea is that, you know, every essential need in life is a, a short walk away or a, a short ride on, on public transportation or a bike um, uh, to get uh, access. So yeah, definitely uh, the, the, the physical built environment, land use and zoning um, is important part of this and figuring out how do we um, allow more people to, to share the pie and the riches of uh, living in a walkable community. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up land use because that was the the next thing I wanted to to talk about. So that was a, a perfect segue. Um, and <clears throat> something that's come up a couple times in the, the questions that are that are rolling in is some of these the lower density communities, right, or suburban communities that where where most Americans live and and work. Um, how how do we uh, retrofit suburbia? How do we provide options? beyond the the communities in this country that have been traditionally built for for public transit access and drum I'll, I'll pitch that back to you and see if you have any thoughts about kind of expanding the the use of transit beyond um those transit oriented communities that exist today yeah i'm happy to start this one out um, well, so one of the things that we're seeing uh, in a few places, and, and my mind is, uh, it's escaping me the specific examples, but particularly in the United States, we, we built a lot of malls, these huge suburban shopping malls. And uh, many of those malls are now closed or you know, on the brink of failure. Um, but in a lot of communities, these have also presented opportunities. You have this huge swath of land that's sitting there. Um, and you're beginning to see conversion of malls into schools or other communities. You're beginning to see these be converted into um, what some people might call like a lifestyle center. But um, really the, the idea of thinking about how can we create density? How can we create density at different levels that supports the community? I think a lot of times people hear the word density and there's almost a fear associated because they think immediately about a skyscraper. And, um, you know, density can simply mean uh, you know, allowing accessory dwelling units, you know, ADUs or, or granny flats, as they're sometimes called. Um, and so uh, in the suburban context, though, I think we're beginning to see more communities sort of wake up to the idea that um, people love this, this notion of sort of a main street and really thinking about how do we reuse properties, uh, specifically malls, to kind of begin to build that out of a, a more walkable, connected area that has multiple things that um, someone, you know, can reduce their need to drive if they maybe they still might need to drive to one place, but at least they're driving to one place to do, you know, all of their shopping and run their errands as opposed to having to drive, you know, from the hardware store to Walmart down to Target, you know. Um, and and then you know as as i mentioned uh, communities in uh, there's a whole kind of swath and range of suburbs from our traditional streetcar suburbs all the way to you know where we have big giant uh, separation of uses and and what we call stroads really big wide roads with with no access to crossing so um, i think communities are beginning to uh, sort of realize that you know this design uh, is not uh, you know ideal and beginning to figure about you know how do we do road diets and how do we think about ways to um, you know give people safe passage and the importance of of bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Very good. Thanks for that. And I, mindful of the time, we got about fifteen minutes left, and there's there's still a bunch of questions coming in. So. I want to shift gears a little bit and pick up on something that both Sam and, and Anna talked about, which is the relationship between the using transit as a tool to, to address climate goals, but also using transit at the same time to address safety and health uh, and, and those kind of outcomes. Um, and, and I want to turn this one to you next. I mean, what, what strategies are you seeing um, that kind of hit all those three uh, things at the same time, and how do we make sure that that it that our strategies are multifaceted um, when we're when we're looking at at different ways to allocate resources? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Jerome mentioned in his opening sort of statement that we need to think about sustainability, you know, more than just greenhouse gases. You know, that's one big component, but it's not the only component. I think sometimes the focus on this has led to a lot of the conversations centering on electrification of our transport fleet, 
electrification of cars and single occupancy vehicles. And even though this is a really important piece of the puzzle, it's not the only puzzle because we run the risk of then just swapping, you know, 20,000 cars for 20,000 electric cars. And this does nothing to, you know, alleviate congestion, give people, you know, more reliability in their journey time, whether they're driving or using public transport. And mobility is so key to equality. Like mobility is access. It's access to school. It's access to, you know, work. It's being able to, you know, not just get a job, but arrive consistently on time for that job so that you can advance through the ranks. And without, you know, providing this access to mobility options, whether it's public transport, yet whether it's for the whole journey or part of your journey, it's going to be so critical to helping these communities, you know, move up and, and access this opportunity. And so when we think about what is going to provide the greatest overall good, it's not electrification, it's giving people more mobility options. Um, you know, if we provide better public transport and get more people into public transport, not only does that have a benefit through taking more cars off the road, it helps alleviate congestion, which has an economic benefit for the whole of the city. Um, it also like gives us options for how we use that land instead of having these eight lane highways that you know, separate communities. We can have, you know, bus rapid transit lanes, we can have cycleways, uh, we can have, you know, rail, we can have parks and pedestrianship. And so I think when we talk about sustainable cities and have that climate change debate, we shouldn't be putting our blinders on and just focusing on, you know, climate emissions, uh, carbon emissions. We we really need to be thinking about how do we connect people to more mobility options. So part of that is increasing public transport services. Part of that is making sure the new modes that are coming available are working with our public transport networks and not cannibalizing it and making sure they're deployed equitably across communities. Um, and then as well, when we look at things like congestion pricing and those non-transit options, making sure, you know, we've properly uh, talked to the different communities and made sure the way that we're implementing them is not going to adversely impact, you know, black or brown communities or other communities that have been made vulnerable, whether due to age, income. Um, and I think, you know, even when we do look at the the carbon emissions and air quality, you know, again, there is a big equity component to that. Um, you know, zoning laws, Highways Act, you know, all of these policies in America were built to, to separate and segregate our communities. And as men, you know, specific communities do have like higher asthma rates. They are more at the forefront of a lot of the damaging outcomes of climate change. So we need to be very mindful of this when we look at what policies we're choosing to pursue and implement. Sam, anything to add to that? No, I think uh, Anna nailed it. I don't have anything to, to add. Okay. Or Jerome? That was fantastic. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, so I think one of the things that keeps coming up is the, the financial um, component. Um, and people in the, the, uh, on the, the live webinar here are really concerned about how we um, balance strategies to invest in transit, right? Whether that's increased operations, whether that's new rail lines, uh, new bus lanes, right? With other climate strategies like electrifying the bus fleet um, or um, things that are not transit related that, that also could affect the, the overall uh, climate strategy. So how, how do we kind of balance those kind of things um, in a comprehensive plan and if we think that it's valuable, how do we raise the money to do it? I mean, I think Jerome, you mentioned ballot measures. Sam, you mentioned congestion pricing. Um, but ultimately, we're gonna have to pay for a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I'm not sure if in, any one of you wants to jump in on this question, but it's there's a, a few folks that have asked about this specifically. Um, Sam, your hands up. Well, it, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, it, obviously, those decisions can happen at many different levels. 
can't they? So, you know, government central level, you know, in terms of the built environment, retrofitting, housing, decarbonizing industry um, versus transport. Um, uh, but we need to also um, just going back to that integrated approach, you know, it's not just about, um, you know, decarbonizing the transport system in itself. There's a huge asset and certainly in London, a network that is woven throughout the city. So how can we leverage that asset? You know, we've got uh, one of the largest high voltage private power networks, uh, a lot of land, a lot of buildings. So if we're taking that integrated approach, we're using waste heat from the tube and feeding that into um, district uh, heating systems, which we do do. And we're speaking with the market about doing more of that. Um, what can we do in terms of our huge electricity supply to be a, an anchor off taker? So can people build solar farms close enough to our network that they can supply local communities? But given that they need to, you know, they need to, uh, uh, someone with a large amount of demand to be that anchor off taker so that they, to make the project viable. So when the community doesn't need as much electricity, they can feed it through to us to put it in simple terms. This is what I mean about a place based approach and really considering how we can work together and how we can package it up and uh, and present it uh, to the market. In terms of those day to day decisions, um, it is about all the things that Anna and, and Jerome have been talking about. That you know, we need to improve our maturity and our ability to make these balanced decisions for years, and con and continues to be quite often. It's all about money and milestones. What are we going to do to GDP? Gross value added. How are we going to increase the economy? The economy and certainly GDP as a measure doesn't tell you what that's delivering. It's just measuring financial flows around the system, and we need to have the same kind of seat at the table. So even if you were just looking in terms of um uh kind of it, it, uh, benefits to to gdp or safety and reliability you're looking at an incomplete model because you haven't taken account of the impacts of climate change and how that's going to impact on your um uh, your modeling uh, and as as i said at the start this is going to fundamentally change everything about the way we think whether you like it or not whether you believe it's a bit problem or not it's just common sense so if you want to be a successful city, if you want to be a successful organization, you need to put this at your core. You're simply not going to be around in the future. You're not going to be relevant. Um, and that is about developing those tools, as I say, and having that maturity and, and ability to make those decisions. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly say that um, I, I think in terms of raising general awareness and influencing um elected officials you know i think several of the problems that we have are are not technical problems but they're more ones of leadership and political will and i think this is where advocacy definitely plays a huge role um people advocating and organizing and and kind of pushing for the changes they would like to see on the local state and even national uh, level. And uh, I, I think that cannot be lost that, you know, in order to win this this fight for better transit, more funding and and equity and, and climate, um, you know, we really do need to kind of have more people um, sort of beating the drum about this is important to me, this is important to my community, and I want to see these changes happen. And so um, I, I do think it's really important uh, that that, uh, that gets mentioned, because uh, at the end of the day, you know, who people decide to put in office um, really does matter, and their policies and their beliefs, uh, you know, um, will ultimately shape the decisions that get made. Um, and I think Sam mentioned, you know, the people that that come to meetings or people that show up, right? There's always the people who oppose something, um, but uh, we just as importantly need people who support something to show up, and we need to give a voice to those who may not have a voice. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That was going to be my next question is those those political hurdles, right? And, and Sam, you talked about that um, and some of the strategy you all have used in, in London. I think that sometimes the political dynamic here in the United States is even more fraught, um, a lot of opponents to um, some of these strategies. And so, I don't know, Anna, if you have any thoughts on, on places that you've seen overcoming political challenges, whether it's through advocacy or other strategies, um, to help communicate um, some of the, the potential benefits of, of things that, that are coming online. Yeah, I think with that, communication is so key. I think 
you know, in the transport community, whether it's public or private, we don't always do the best job of communicating why what we're doing is important and why it's going to be important long term. You know, you look at some of the cycleways that have gone in and it's outcry. People don't want their journey to take longer because they've lost a lane of traffic. You look at when people want to raise tolls or raise fares and, you know, I can understand why elected officials, you know, shy back from that fight. And so I think, you know, we need to do a much better job of communicating to the general public why these things are necessary and we need to put pressure on our public officials to hold fast and stay true. You know, if you believe in in what you're trying to implement, you know, be open to the criticism and listen for, for the real lessons to be learned, but don't let the noise of people let you, you know, have an out, you know, don't shy away from that fight. If you believe that this is what needs to change for your city or your community, be vocal, speak up, place that pressure on on your elected officials to to not cave to to people who just want to drive. Um, and I think there are some really positive uh, things that are happening at the moment. You look at the way the infrastructure bill is written to have, you know, components specifically related to sustainability and equity. And I think you know, this is becoming more front and center of our um, land use planning, transport planning discussions. And I think we need to really keep that momentum there and and do a better job of, of understanding, you know, why this is important. Very good. Um, we've got four minutes left before we've, uh, we have the top of the hour. And so I want to just go around um, one more time to, uh, Get, get a few final examples, something that has come up a couple of times in, in the questions. Um, and I think something that people are always hungry for is, is good examples. And so the, the final question, and you can add, add to your, your own thoughts to this, you know, one, one minute or so. Um, when, when you're looking for good examples of transit strategies um, that are trying to reach these goals, you know, what, what regions globally or in the US or wherever, where, where do you look? Um, what what are some of the the top regions that you think are are doing really good things? We'll start with Jerome, and we'll go to Anna, and then we'll finish up with you, Sam. Yeah, so I'll close off by saying um, just to reiterate a, a point that I've made a few times that the the biggest thing we can do to uh, make transit a a more viable and competitive option. Uh, and a tool in our fight for equity and climate change is to run more trains and buses more often all day, every day. I mean, we, we, that is just essential to uh, giving access and also allowing people to to uh, think about mode shift. Uh, that's really critical. And we've seen examples, uh, you know, all around uh, this country, large and small cities, uh, as I mentioned, sort of taking matters into their own hands in terms of, you know, uh, either ballot measures or allocating uh, other funds to to increase service operations. And so, um, you know, there, there are several cities to look to um, but I, I think ultimately, at the end of the day, we, we have to make transit so easy to use, so robust and prevalent uh, that it's a no brain, no brainer solution and, and choice for for people that may have other choices um, to really get the results that we want to see in terms of reducing emissions and uh, access uh, to opportunity. Excellent. Thanks for that. Anna? Uh, I think London is a great example. Uh, I lived there for two years and it's one of the easiest cities to navigate public transport by. I think uh, they've done fantastic work with making sure, you know, um, residential developments are built close to transport links so that people do not live more than five to 10 minutes away from their nearest transport hubs. I think they've done a great job uh, implementing cycleways through the city and having the Santander bike program readily available for people to use if they don't want to take public transport. And I think uh, also the work they've been doing with congestion, low emissions pricing is, is fantastic. Uh, in the United States, I think LA has um, 
should be a really good model for data sharing their DMS. Um, it's been widely politicized and I know it's been quite controversial, but really, you know, understanding how people are using your network and using public corridors. If you don't understand where people hop on services, where people get off, why people are choosing different modes, why, when they travel at different times, you're really never going to know how your network is being utilized and then be able to make sure it works more efficiently and better for the people who who need it. So I think um, they're a really good model for, for mobility data sharing. Um, Australia, I think they've really excelled with their kind of like transport availability on that hub and spoke model. Um, the levels with which people use public transport to commute into their CBD for work is really high um, compared to a lot of other places. And obviously this is going to be challenged by, by COVID and we're going to need to think of more creative ways to to use, you know, whether it's mobility on demand, public transport or, or other options to to connect uh, communities now that they aren't necessarily traveling day in, day out to, to the one place. But I think there are some really great, uh, great work that, that people are doing. And I think it's just important to recognize, as Sam said, there's not one silver bullet. You know, London benefits from being a small, dense population which you know, is very different to LA where it's very spread out and that obviously raises more challenges with service provision um, and connecting communities. And I think we just need to you know, recognize for a moment that's not about one technology or one answer. There are lots of great companies developing fantastic solutions to mobility challenges, but implementing these in isolation or as a one-stop shop is never going to be an effective approach. You know, we can't piecemeal this together. It needs to be strategic um, if we're gonna get to this place where we have that highly operable network where all these policy levers, you know, incentivization and, and provision of service is going to create the outcomes that we wanna see. Thanks for that. And we'll go over to Sam. I, you know, I'm sure you appreciated Anna's answer about TFL, but or in London generally. But uh, yeah, I'd like to hear your kind of closing thoughts here before we wrap up. Thank you, and thank you, Anna. Um, when when it comes to kind of sustainability and taking a whole whole system approach, uh, they are smaller populations, so so less of a challenge. But I think we could learn a lot from countries like Costa Rica, Cuba, and particularly the Scandinavian countries. Um, it's very hard for us, me, um, you know, to, to think very much in terms of UK and, and US. And I think in the US, there's a, a big problem there, we must admit, just thinking the world is the US and then the baddies, and I won't name names. Um, but there's a lot of other countries where actually they have a better quality of life because they really do put people first and they take a sustainability approach. We didn't get time to talk about it, but um, definitely worth looking at Copenhagen in terms of their adaptation approach. This is a massive problem. Most of the money's going towards mitigation. Most of the money's going towards new technology as opposed to system change. We've got to deal with it all. Uh, and adaptation is a massive underdog when it comes to uh, the climate uh, change challenges that we face. Well, well said. And uh, I I'm agree that we could talk about a lot of this stuff for, for in a much longer conversation. I've, I've certainly enjoyed the discussion today. I want to appreciate or thank all of you and, and very much appreciate your time um, this afternoon talking through some of these big challenges. Um, again, we hope to continue this conversation uh, in future webinars, future discussions. Um, thanks everyone on the line for joining and, and a special thanks to our panelists for their thoughts and expertise. Um, and we hope to see you all on the next webinar. Thanks everyone.